here on the internet and we are live. So why aren't dogs good dancers? Because they have two left feet. Welcome to the Bite Back Tour. Uh, my name is Levy Sun and today we're going to talk about healthy homes and happy pets. If you're watching, you're watching on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook, or even on our website. And our theme today is all about making your home more healthy uh, and, and also having your pets be more happy, which will hopefully result in less biting as, as well around the home. So to start off, I want to just have uh, some introductions here uh, going around. So we'll start with Pablo and then our special guest, Jennifer. Everyone, my name is Pablo Cabrera and I'm the communication specialist here at the district. And hi, I'm uh, Jennifer Sinatra, and I'm a veterinarian with Los Angeles County Veterinary Public Health. Um, and we, you know, work to help keep people and their pets healthy, um, both in terms of pet bites and animal diseases and, and all sorts of things like that. So today we have a really exciting and jam-packed uh, series of questions and information to share with you. If you have any pets at home, you know, any fur babies at home, you do want to tune in because we have a lot of great information that may affect you or may not affect you directly, but someone you may know. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about mosquito control, what we do, some things to look out for, especially around the home. And then we'll dive into some questions that have been submitted ahead of time uh, for Jennifer to discuss with us here. So first up, in order to create more bite-free communities, we need to know what to do around our individual properties. And we assist with that here in Mosquito Control in educating folks about some of the things they can and can do to reduce the bite pressure uh, for mosquitoes, especially mosquitoes around the home. Uh, lots of people have asked us about some basic maintenance they can do around the home. And we tell them many homes have items that are often overlooked or sometimes they are seen, but often ignored. And one of those could be your yard drains. Uh, in terms of yard drains, we highly recommend that you flush them out if you can or clean them out regularly. Uh, we know that a lot of residents have actually put screening over the top of these drains so that they can prevent mosquitoes from diving in there, laying their eggs, and then you know, flying back out once they emerge. And other folks have talked about uh, what to do about rain barrels. I don't know about you, I can't recall the last time it actually rained very much. But we do know there are a lot of rain barrels out there, and that can not only create an issue for pests like mosquitoes around the home, but it can become a water quality issue. Rain barrels are meant to um, store the water only briefly and then be used. These are not meant to be actual water barrels. And having these rain barrels be, un uh, to be opened up, exposed to the environment, can also bring all kinds of wildlife that you may not want uh, around your home. So we always recommend that you do regular maintenance checks on your rain barrels. Um, make sure you use that water within a couple of weeks, hopefully within a week before um, it's too late and the water becomes too nasty to be used for anything um, around your home. And of course, we cannot forget about swimming pools. Um, many of us do have swimming pools or know a neighbor or friend that has swimming pools. Did you know that a full swimming pool that's gone green and nasty can produce up to 3 million mosquitoes a month? Now, granted, based on the ratio of how they emerge, about half of them will be female mosquitoes, which means uh, only female mosquitoes will bite. So about you know, uh, 1.5 million mosquitoes emerging into a community, but that's still a lot of mosquitoes inundating us. So we always tell people to please clean up that pool. Uh, chlorine is, is definitely necessary. Chlorine in the pool doesn't specifically kill the mosquitoes. It kills off the food source, the organic matter that the mosquito larvae would feed on. And having a pump that circulates the water is especially useful uh, because it will keep the water moving and not stay stagnant. Uh, just a quick pause here. If you're watching, you're watching the Bite Back Tour. We're talking about happy homes and healthy pets. If you have any pets or if you are a DIY type around the home, you want to tune into this. Uh, if you're watching, you're watching on YouTube, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and even on our website. And if you're watching on our website or even on some of these other social media platforms, check out the chat. That's actually either to your right, whichever way you're watching me, and there's down below a chat box um, on our website. You can submit a question. We'll field those questions as they come along, and we'll uh, have myself, Pablo, or Jennifer answer them. All right. Uh, now... It is nearing 
almost mosquito season. Actually, I would say there really isn't a season. Just like fire season, mosquito activity is year round. So we want you to be vigilant around the home. And we, are, we will remain vigilant as well with our trapping program with mosquitoes. Not saying that we will trap mosquitoes out of the environment, which I know some of you would love, but our traps are there to take a snapshot of what's going on in your community. Uh, we take these traps and we take the mosquitoes in there, we sort them out and we send them out for testing for anything like West Nile virus. Uh, West Nile virus is the most pervasive current threat to human health right now, but we are also on the lookout for emerging diseases that have been hitting us um, every now and then in pockets, uh, such as uh, yellow fever, dengue, uh, Zika, uh, and chikungunya. These are diseases or pathogens we don't want in our community swirling around. So we're doing everything we can to at least stay on top of it and working with our partners in LA County Public Health to make sure we have a more comprehensive picture and an action plan in case there ever is an emergency where you do see an outbreak. Uh, one thing I do want to point out um, here is a lot of people, when we talk about pets and homes, they think about one particular type of mosquitoes, um, one genus or group called 80s. Not the decade 80s. Uh, I don't mind bringing that back, but I don't want to bring back these 80s mosquitoes. Uh, many wow. of you who have seen them um, notate them as being black and white striped. They're very aggressive biters. They are, uh, these, these species that are in our cities in your neighborhoods are invasive, which means they don't belong here in our natural habitat. Uh, and these are the ones that we are most concerned with. And I know at this point, some people will ask, well, what about all the other mosquitoes? Can't we just get rid of all of them? Answer is uh, no. We do know that there is some, some value in many of these species. In fact, only 3% of all mosquito species actually have an impact on human health in some way. There are um, out of the three, more than 3000 species out there um, in our district, we have maybe a little under a dozen species that actually can be a nuisance or can be um, impactful or negative, negatively impactful to our health when they bite us. Uh, but the most persistent one are these 80s mosquitoes. And we tell people they are a game changer. If you grew up here in Southern California, um, you probably know the Culex mosquitoes more. You probably don't know them as Culex, but they're a different group of mosquitoes. And they're the ones that tend to bite at dawn or dusk. And they're not as aggressive. And they don't bite people primarily. They prefer to bite birds uh, as their blood meal source. And then unfortunately, because of the way we've urbanized Southern California, um, there are not always birds around. So they end up biting us, people. and and yes, that does mean that some diseases or pathogens can be passed on to us from these uh, mosquitoes, from these birds, and that would be West Nile virus. So as I know some people have said that mosquitoes, I saw a comment here uh, the other day that mosquitoes, or I'm sorry, West Nile virus is a bird disease. I guess to sum it up, yeah, um, it's supposed to circulate between birds and mosquitoes. But because of the fact that we get bit back by these mosquitoes, the mosquitoes can transfer West Nile virus from the bird uh, to people. The good news is overall, um, we are considered dead end hosts. And the fact that we do not transmit West Nile virus to another person, it's not contagious through a cough or a sneeze or a handshake, um, but we can get ill from it. One in five people will experience symptoms um, that are flu-like. And I believe one in 150 um, may be hospitalized with further complications. And uh, maybe if I may interrupt, when it comes to the Culex or the 80s mosquitoes, the black and white, why do I feel like I'm almost attacked by the 80s mosquitoes, <laughs> the Culex mosquitoes? And that comes down to something very simple and that's their biting behavior. Culex mosquitoes tend to land on you or a bird and sit there until they get their abdomen swelled up with all that blood. They, they sit there like they're at a buffet, just feeding that one time only. They don't go back for seconds usually. But the 80s mosquitoes are snackers, uh, which means uh, if they're at a buffet, they'll take small platefuls at a time and come back up and get some more. Um, if you swat them away, they'll come right back uh, uh, circle around you and bite you a couple more times, which is why sometimes when I go outdoors and I, if I'm not wearing repellent, I get easily six bites just from one mosquito within a minute or so. Um, and that is very telling of how these mosquitoes are embedded in our community because they do prefer biting on people. 
and they spread very quickly. And it's not like we can just tip out stagnant water and be done with these 80s mosquitoes. Now, many of you who grew up in Southern California have heard about getting rid of stagnant water constantly. It's the go-to measure to get rid of mosquitoes around your home. But what many people don't know about these 80s mosquitoes since they arrived here in 2011 in large quantities is that they stick their eggs individually on above the water line on containers or even on plant stalks resting in, in stagnant water. And these eggs can stay viable for at least a year. With, um, so if you toss out that water, great. But if you refill that water back in maybe later, or if you move to a different city or neighborhood and you bring that container with you and you reintroduce water back into that same container, you can have a new population of 80s mosquitoes or ankle biters as some call it, uh, sprouting up in your neighborhood. Now, what do we do about them? Um, obviously water, it's getting rid of stagnant water is key, but uh, we'll talk more about what we can do a little bit later on. But what I want to do is get our special guest, Jennifer, in on our discussion regarding pets because one species of these 80s mosquitoes have a direct impact on our pets. And that one's called Aedes notoscriptus, uh, the Australian backyard mosquito. Uh, when I talked to some of our colleagues in Mosquito Control Australia, um, I, they joked and called it the Aussie Mozzie, uh, which I actually would prefer more than Australian backyard mosquito. Um, but they can transmit uh, canine heartworm to our pets. But I'll go ahead and have uh, Jennifer talk a little more about this a little bit later once it's appropriate. But for now, we do have one question that came that that we have um, listed here um, for Jennifer. So question one is, what are some best practices that residents can use to stay bite free while enjoying the outdoors? Um, yeah, I, so I mean, some of these things are gonna, I think you've actually covered a lot of this question, um, but and a lot of these things will be the same, whether you're talking about yourself or your pets, um, you know, uh, we talked, we talked a lot about getting rid of standing water and that's certainly like goal number one, right? Um, if you have pet water that stays outside, make sure you're cleaning it out. Um, you know, hopefully even more frequently than once a week, but at least any, any standing water, at least once a week to, um, make sure that there aren't mosquitoes in it. Obviously pet water, you probably, if you have it outside, you want to clean it more frequently than that. Although we'll probably touch later probably ideal not to leave any water or food for your pets outside because you're potentially going to attract other wildlife. But that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, in, in terms of pets, you know, it's difficult for them to uh, wear long pants or long sleeve shirts like <laughs> we sometimes recommend for people. Although, you know, if that's their thing, that's great. Um, but there are um, some, uh, th there, there are, um, there are spray mosquito sprays and stuff that you can use on pets. And that's something you can talk to your veterinarians about. There's also um, lots of other parasite control out there. Um, I can touch a little bit more on heartworm now, or if we want to keep, I don't know if you have other questions coming up for that. Um, yeah. yeah, why don't we dive into that? Um, I know a lot of people consider pets practically, they are family members. And yeah. a biggest aha or uh-oh moment I get from residents when I talk about canine or heartworm uh, as in, impacted by our Aussie mozzies here in LA County is what do we do? What is it? Um, yeah. So maybe just some insight on that. Sure. And I'll go ahead and I'm um, just going to share something here. Uh, let's see here. While you're pulling that up, if you're watching yeah. this, the bite back tour, you know, um, feel free to drop in a comment in the chat or a question in our text box and we can answer that as we go along. Okay, sorry, this has taken me. I always think I have it figured out. And then... <laughs> All good, okay. yeah, not a problem. Okay, hopefully you're seeing this uh, heartworm. Yes. And my notes, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so heartworm is certainly the biggest concern for pets, especially dogs. Um, I just put up a kind of a life cycle of heartworm and you can see, or, and, and you can see that we have a mosquito that is taking a blood meal. Sometimes it'll take a blood meal from a person. That's less of a concern for heartworm, certainly. But um, essentially, if they take a bite from a dog that is infected, the larvae of the heartworm um, will enter the bite wound if the mosquito is carrying it. Um, and then and infect that dog, I'm sorry. And, and then those adults will go into the pulmonary artery 
and um, basically produce what are called microfilariae. Those are essentially heartworm larvae, and um, and they go throughout the blood eventually once once they have adults in the heart. Um, and then once a dog is infected, a mosquito will bite that dog um, and, and then can go on to um, infect other animals um, or other dogs and potentially cats as well can be impacted. Um, and, and so the, the heartworms go through these, these different larva stages um, in, in the mosquito allowing the mosquito to reinfect the dog. There's a person on here, this is a CDC slide, um, and there is a person on here because people actually can be infected with heartworm. It's, it's not very common and it doesn't usually cause um, illness or anything, but it can cause some diagnostic difficulties with other diseases. So it is certainly hmm. something to keep in mind. Um, so what are some things to watch out for? Uh, if you, uh, if, are there symptoms a dog might exhibit or a cat might exhibit? Yeah, I mean, the big symptoms that we uh, think of is, um, you know, coughing is one that definitely comes to mind if a dog is infected, um, you know, lethargy, uh, exercise intolerance, those are probably the most common things that we see. Uh, honestly, the most important thing is, um, is, is that, I'm going to stop sharing here, um, is is that we put the, that we prevent heartworm disease in dogs and that we test for it. Um, and so there's lots of heartworm preventives out there and I'd advise that you reach out, you know, any veterinarian can help you with that. Typically they do want to test for heartworm before starting the dog on a preventive. A preventive is typically like a monthly oral medication that they receive. And, and some of them, um, they'll typically prevent against um, heartworm. And then there's others that will also help with fleas and ticks and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and also protect against intestinal worms, which can be another issue, certainly. Um, but, but that's something that would be good to talk to your veterinarian about. Um, but, you and know? Then, yeah, sorry, the, the other reason is that, that we do test is that there are often animals that can be infected, um, but actually not show any clinical signs because they don't, they don't show those signs of tiredness or anything in, until they have a more severe infestation where there's actually worms growing in their heart. And I'll also point out just fun fact, um, the female worms can grow up to 14 inches. So you can imagine wow. if you've got a worm of that size, especially if it's like a smaller dog um, in their heart, um, how much that could impact the ability of their heart to pump blood to the rest of their body and, and why they do have these issues um, with, with you know, essentially being tired and coughing and that sort of thing. And I know um, this question, the answer depend on the, you know, the, the individual dog, but generally how fast do these heartworms grow in the dog bef um, before it reaches a critical point where you're like, uh oh, something's really wrong here. Yeah, so we call um, that like it's like a six months. I think it's called like a pre-patent period is a technical term. But basically, um, once a dog is infected, they the heartworms grow um, in approximately six months. Um, during the first three months, the larvae migrate through the animal's body um, until they reach the blood vessels um, near the lungs, and then um, the during the last three months, that's when those immature worms grow and develop. Um, you know, potentially up to that length of 14 inches. Um, I don't know that that happens quite that quickly, but, um, but yeah. So. I mean, that's horrifying to even think yeah. about. Jeez, yeah. 14 inches of worm in the heart. <laughs> I, mean, I, I should have pulled up a picture. You can, you can find pictures of, 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 you know, dog hearts with heartworms in them. And I, I should have thought to get one, but I don't have one. Right now, but, <laughs> well, we'll um, save our <laughs> audience uh, their lunch then if they're having it yeah, right now. <laughs> exactly. Um, um, we'll go on, since we talk about symptoms, we'll go to question number three that we had on here is, what are some other signs that our pets may be sick um, that we should look out for? Yeah, I mean, it's going to vary a little bit um, on, on the type of pet. Um, you know, obviously the signs that you see in a dog might be different than the signs you see in like an iguana, right? Um, and speaking of dogs, mine just barked. Let me close my door here. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, your pet the best, right? And, and so if you have a hunch that your pet isn't feeling well, you know, I would say to consult with your veterinarian, but essentially, you know, changes in behavior, are they more tired than usual? Are they not eating as well? And, and you don't have a good reason for it. I mean, yeah, if it's one of these, you know, 105 degree days, and your dog is acting more tired, like, 
you know, that's probably okay as long as he comes back to normal and it's not extreme. Um, but, but that's one of the big things is just, you know, are they behaving dif differently? Um, do they have any diarrhea or vomiting or changes in urination? Um, we, we had an outbreak of a disease recently called leptospirosis, where one of the biggest signs is that the dog drinks a lot and pees a lot more than usual, essentially. So um, things like that to look for. Also changes in skin, changes in coat. Um, you know, that might be a sign of a more longer term disease, but it's also something to keep an eye on. Um, and just more specifically, since I talked a bit about dogs, um, cats, you know, they're a little bit harder to see um, how they're doing, but any changes in litter box use mm -hmm. um, or again, changes in behavior. And for a cat, a change in behavior could be a very social cat suddenly doesn't like want to come out from under your bed and is just hiding more. Um, or if they're sitting or moving differently or not jumping up on things like they used to do that sort of thing. Um, so it is all a bit of a judgment. And, and then, you know, you can bring them into a veterinarian who can do a bit more specific diagnostics. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, I, knowing that, um, knowing a benchmark of or a baseline of your cat's or your pet's behavior is definitely key. Yeah. Um, if you're just tuning in, this is the Bite Back Tour. With uh, we're here with Jennifer Sinatra with the LA County Public Health Department. Uh, she's a veterinarian there, and we are also here with me, uh, with Pablo and myself. And you're watching this on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, or even on our website. Please drop in a comment or question if you have any. And we'll be sure to um, answer them as we go along. Um, our next question will be more about repellent, because I know we get a lot of questions about re repellent on pets and also on people. So um, the question here is, what type of repellent works best for people? And what can we do to keep our pets bite free and healthy? Um, I guess we can start with the people and talk about some of the repellents that we know works. Um, it's EPA registered, CDC recommended, and the, there are four main ingredients that we tell people to look for. It, uh, the gold standard has always been DEET, but then we have other options like oil of lemon eucalyptus, IR3535, and picaridin. Um, on the shelves right now, you can probably find picaridin, oil of lemon eucalyptus, also known as PMD, um, more often, and along with DEET. IR3535 is a little harder to find, but whatever you choose, um, choose the one that's best for you. Uh, people have also complained in the past about DEET, but that's because they're using maybe 50% DEET, 80% DEET. So it almost feels like a thick layer of what seems like oil or something on your skin. They do formulate them now to be 5%. Um, so they smell better and they are more easy to put on. Now, now in terms of percentages, we do let everyone know that percentages do not equal uh, strength. So just because you put on 90% means that you're looking at strength It's looking at longevity. So EPA has done lots of studies on a percentage and it's concluded that if you're out there for maybe 30 minutes to do light gardening, uh, you want to put on 5%, 5 to 10% of a active ingredient approximately. And if you're going out hiking in the, in the tropics of Costa Rica, then definitely put on that 80 plus percent DEET. So that way you stay more bite free. But the question we get that we can't always answer is what about our pets? And that's why we have Jennifer here to give some insight on how we can keep our pets more bite free. Yeah, so like I said, you know, the more common um, types of, uh, of repellents that, that you'll often get are, are not so much for mosquitoes, but more for, um, for well, for, for to prevent the heartworm, um, the, the heartworm uh, parasite, and then also um, for intestinal worms. And then there's also products that protect against fleas and ticks. And some of those actually kind of interesting. I've had this happen with my own dog. Um, they, they actually, even if a tick does bite your dog, they actually kill the tick on your dog. So I've had that happen where my dog had a tick, but because he was unpreventive, the tick was actually dead on him and not able to prevent disease. Um, and those are typically um, things that are given, you know, often by prescription and they're, you know, either monthly or, or three month um, or oral, uh, oral um, preparations. Um, there are some things out there um, that could contain ingredients like permethrin um, that can help prevent against mosquitoes. Um, and I believe some of those are available over the counter or again, you can consult with your veterinarian. Um, there are so, also are some like spray products, um, but I think permethrin is typically a pretty common ingredient in those. Thank you so much for the insight. Um, I got another joke for everyone here who's watching. Why did the cat run away from the tree? It was scared of its bark. <laughs> if I had a drum up to do, I would use that. 
I use my <laughs> own one. Um, if you're watching right now, this is the Bite Back Tour, and we're talking about happy homes and healthy pets. And considering the season we're walking into, it being pretty darn hot already, um, another concern we, that we get a lot from residents is about the heat impact on our pets. So question five here is, what are some ways we can keep our pets safe from the heat? And hopefully, uh, Jennifer, you have some insight on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I mean, again, a lot of these things, you know, would be similar to what we'd apply to ourselves, right? If we're feeling really hot, um, our pets are probably feeling hotter. At least a lot of our pets um, have that extra layer of fur that we don't carry around and, and they can't really just take that off, obviously. Um, so, so that's one thing just to keep in mind. If you're hot, um, your pet is hotter. Um, so definitely offering unlimited access to fresh water, um, making sure that if they are outside that they do have access to shade. And you know, sometimes again, they'll want to lie in the sun for a while, but we wanna make sure that they're choosing when to move um, from the hot area into a cooler spot or, or inside the house. Um, Obviously, you know, consider leaving your pet at home um, if you're going somewhere like, and it's hot out. Um, maybe they don't need to come with you. Certainly don't leave them in the car. Um, we are, we've seen different um, uh, messaging about how hot a car can get, even when it's only like 70 or 80 degrees outside if it's sunny and, and just how quickly it can get hot and how dangerous it is to leave um, our pets in the car if, if it's getting hot like that. Um, you know, other things to think about, a lot of people do think about um, the like a dog and their paws when you're going on walks. Um, and that is certainly something important to think about. Um, you can they can you can take walks during the cooler part of the day, either early in the day or late in the day. Um, avoid hot surfaces that might burn paws, like maybe if grass is an option to walk on instead of the asphalt, that would obviously be a, a cooler option. Um, and they make shoes if your dog is willing to wear shoes and want to wear them to protect their feet, like that's another really great option. Um, and then in, in terms of dogs that are more affected by their animals, truly dogs or other animals that are more affected by the heat, um, animals that are overweight, um, it is important to try and keep animals at a healthy weight. Um, being overweight does put just a lot greater strain on their bodies and their joints. Um, but especially in the heat, they just have a little bit more trouble breathing usually. <clears throat> and then short nose breeds like our pugs, our French bulldogs, um, you know, all those little cute smushy nose dogs um, are more affected uh, by the hot weather just because they sometimes have some more breathing issues. Um, heat stress in a dog can look uh, a lot like and in cats, too, I should say. I keep saying dogs, but, but gen a lot of this is general information that would apply to a lot of animals. Um, but heat stress can look like the animal is anxious. They might be panting a lot more. They could be restless. Um, they could have abnormal gum and tongue color, like their gums might turn bright red um, and, and eventually they can collapse. So that would obviously <clears throat> be a really scary situation. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Um, it's good to know they have these tips that we can at least keep in the back of our minds, especially as we get hotter. So as you cool yourself down, don't forget to cool down your pets too in the right ways. Uh, let's, turn our let's turn our attention now towards the home itself, um, because many times a lot of our pest issues or even issues regarding fleas can come from just lack of maintenance or improper maintenance of our own property. Uh, so that we move to the next question uh, about home improvement tips. Uh, so what are some home improvement tips that can help prevent bites inside the home? And we can go ahead and start that one off. Now, one big thing we always tell people is look at your screening, your door screening and window screening. That's the most effective way of, of blocking any passageway of, of air from allowing mosquitoes to come in or any kind of flying insect. Um, and actually, I'll just jump in and add if it's okay. Um, yeah. the, a lot of what we work on is, is bats and reports for bats. I know it's not exactly on topic, but we really encourage checking your screens to prevent bats from coming in your house and preventing an exposure to rabies. I just have to throw that in because we're coming into that season as well. Um, so if you talk about screens, I can't help myself. <laughs> no, of course. Yeah, we love that. that and that, that does, is part of it. Uh, we're we'll talking about exclusion of creatures that we, that should not survive in your home and cannot survive in your home and rather keep them out and you know keep your home happy and healthy. Uh, so make sure you check on the screens. Uh, any rips or tears, get that fixed right away. Because uh, that will allow, if you have any rips, even if it's a quarter inch rip, those 80s mosquitoes, those ankle biters can easily find their way in. And not because they know how to get in naturally, it's just that they're following what you breathe out, which is CO2, and they're finding their path right towards you. like. Um, 
like a yeah so they'll come right in and yeah definitely watch for the bats and then i know i speaking of bats actually we did do get a lot of questions about um if whether or not mosquito control can re release thousands of bats into the city to eat mosquitoes <laughs> now there, there, there are multiple answers out there, right there, but the ultimate answer is, unfortunately, it, it, it really depends. That's the scientific answer. And it comes down to the species of bats. Um, also, bats are really quite picky about where they roost. So just setting up bat boxes may not even just, not, won't, it's not a build it and they will come. And they're a protected species too. So there's actually like, you know, legal issues with what you do with bats. And I don't know a whole lot about releasing them, but but yeah, it's a complicated thing. It's an interesting thought. I also just want to add, I love that you have this picture of the window with the duct tape because <laughs> it's not pretty, but it, it's totally effective. Like, and I think it's just an example. If, if you can't get that screen fixed like today, maybe yeah. you can do it next week or or whenever, but duct tape is amazing. And it, it, oh, yeah. it, for the moment, like it works. Well, there's a reason why I think FEMA or one of those uh, agencies that, that talk about emergency prep always have a roll of duct tape, yeah. you know, in your in your bug out bag or something. And duct tape is is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the bats, um, we cannot just release them because they're finicky, and yeah, they they don't always roost where you want them to, and light pollution really messes with them in the cities. Mm -hmm. So, um, so releasing them is not viable. And also people talk about the one often cited research of mosquitoes eating, I think, was it 1500 mosquitoes in an hour, something like that, something more than a thousand mosquitoes in an hour. If you look at the study itself, uh, it was done in a laboratory where all the, all the bats can eat were mosquitoes in an enclosed area. Uh, last time I checked, we don't live in a lab. Um, and one of my uh, colleagues from a different mosquito control district uh, said that if bats were released, and they were to go after flying insects, they're gonna pick probably a moth or several moths over dozens or hundreds of mosquitoes. It's like trying to find, burn the calories to catch a Dorito chip versus a flying steak. Um, you'd rather get more bang for your buck as a bat to catch the moth rather than some mosquitoes here and there. That's really interesting. And maybe just to add to the, the conversation, I really like our to uh, wildlife, because I think especially living in cities and in urbanized areas, we tend to uh, lose that disconnect with the wildlife that we naturally live with, not only bats, but possums or raccoons or other things. So making sure that we have closed um, holes or anything like that, even like underneath our homes, not only are protecting us from the wildlife we share our environment with, but also our pets as well that are most likely to come in contact with this wildlife. Yeah, and I know as much as um, many of us want to feed the wildlife, um, please refrain from doing so because we can acclimate them to city life and they give more contact with us people and our pets and can bring in any of the uh, pathogens or uh, spread the diseases that they may carry. Uh, something else we do want to talk about in terms of home maintenance is dense vegetation. Um, many of your yards are beautiful, um, but unfortunately, many of yours can also provide refuge for not only mosquitoes trying to beat the heat, but larger creatures that may seek refuge as well. So if you have any dense vegetation, like thick ivy growing down a whole section of your wall and home, dense bushes, anything that's even tropical in nature. And I know many of you have those Jurassic Park yards that are quite tropical and they're beautiful, they're shady, but they do provide a lot of um, harborage for mosquitoes too. So even if you're on top of all the stagnant water, mosquitoes will still seek out your type of home because Mosquitoes are terrible at regulating their body temperature. So they do need to beat the heat by looking for shady areas. And obviously when they're in shady areas, we are also likely to be there too, which means that we'll be bit whenever we are outside. So scale back some of that dense vegetation. Uh, if you can get rid of the ivy, please do, because those ivy have big waxy leaves that just provide just dense coverage for these mosquitoes. And then we definitely uh, encourage you to look into planting California native um, landscaping. It has multiple benefits, including uh, providing uh, pollinators, plenty of uh, flowers to work with. It reduces the amount of mosquitoes on a property. It doesn't repel mosquitoes. I know people talk about using sage or some of these other plants to repel. They don't quite repel. It's just that because of the way they grow, they don't provide a dense coverage that an ivy plant would or a dense bush would. And it would, um, it's not as inviting for mosquitoes. To, to land there. And of course, with California native plants, you do save a ton of water, which we do need to do right now. 
Yeah, and you were talking a little bit about, you know, that that dense uh, cover kind of providing not just a home for mosquitoes, but also larger animals. Uh, you know, we think about rats and opossums, and I'm just going to take this as a chance to address another disease we were going to talk about called typhus. Um, and that's a disease that uh, can be spread by, by fleas, basically. Uh, it's transmitted by flea bites. Um, and usually, usually it's a person that has contact or, or, you know, lives near rats, possums, cats, or other animals that carry fleas. Um, and it can cause symptoms like a fever, headache, joint pain, um, sometimes a rash, um, in very serious cases, meningitis, that's fairly rare. Um, but about 10% of cases do end up hospitalized. So it can be a serious disease. Um, and just FYI, there was actually a cluster of typhus uh, in 2021 in Morovia, so in this area that we're covering, um, and then also one in Willowbrook and Westlake, which is a, a neighborhood in, in LA City. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to mention that, you know, and it's the sort of thing we can, you, you can control by controlling fleas on our pets and in the environment, and then doing rodent control and eliminating food sources for animals like rats and possums. So some of that would go into, like you were saying, removing some of that dense cover, um, just giving them less of an opportunity for a place to live. That and then not feeding our animals outside or at least not leaving their food and water mm -hmm. outside. I think that's key. Many of us keep our pets outside in you know San Gabriel Valley. So it's important that you feed them and then clean out that bowl or bring it back in so that it doesn't provide more food for other creatures. Um, milling around our neighborhoods yeah all right um and we're coming down to the end of our show this is the bite back tour um and we are here with jennifer from la county public health um and we're talking about happy homes and healthy pets um one last thing what we will address here is our last question regarding how residents can uh, be motivated to protect the community from mosquitoes and other vectors there are tons of resources out there we will be uh, publishing a blog post later on with the, help of, with the help of Jennifer to gather some of those resources up that more people can reference and get more information on. Uh, so I'll talk about some of the resources that we offer to residents in addition to our, our standard programs. One popular one is the Bite Back program. Uh, this program is meant for residents who want to work together with their neighbors in mosquito control and become a champion to kick mosquitoes out of your neighborhood. And what we do is we work with you and your neighbors on your block and we can go property by property to do uh, special uh, inspections. And we provide a personalized plan to, to um, uh, mitigate any mosquito issues we find. So essentially we help you reset your block and get your neighbors up to date on the latest and greatest on repellents to what they should do around the property, how they should take care of certain water features. Um, and we work with residents as well who aren't that intense, but they still wanna do some stuff like pass out door hangers in your neighborhoods. You can do that as well. And if you're not up for that, just signing up for our emails is also a good step forward in understanding the threats that lurk and buzz behind um, in our backyards. So that's the one thing I do encourage everyone to look into the bitebackchampion.org. Um, Jennifer, any resources you kind of want to talk about that residents can look into? Um, I'm, I don't have any specific resources. I'll see what I can pull um, to put in that blog post. But I will say just in terms of motivating people, you know, everyone is is motivated by different ways. Some people, you know, just don't want to get bit by mosquitoes, which I completely understand, or they don't <laughs> want to get West Nile virus. But, um, you know, maybe telling people that, you know, it's not just us that are affected by this, like your dog can get heartworm, your cat could get heartworm. And it's not even just cats and dogs. Like we know that birds certainly get West Nile virus um, from mosquitoes. Mm. And also, um, not just only birds, but also squirrels, even. Um, we do sometimes have people that report a squirrel that just seem to fall out of a tree and has no sign of trauma or anything. And then we test them and they actually come up positive for West Nile virus. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's not just pets. It kind of, you know, these mosquitoes and some of the diseases they spread can um, affect um, our wildlife as well. Yeah, so every just, some people are inspired by that. <laughs> no, that's true. Every little thing we do has a major impact around. I mean, we are part of the ecosystem. We everything we do has, has an impact and everything we don't do also has a major impact. So yeah, take the little steps to um, take the extra step to protect not only ourselves, but our four-legged friends or two-legged, depending on what you have. <laughs> um, that does round out our bite back tour today. Um, we're going to go into, go into closing remarks and we'll just start off. Uh, I'll just say thank you everyone for joining us. And then uh, Pablo, if you have any closing remarks, please continue. And then after that, we'll have Jennifer close out with her remarks. 
Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for watching our bike back tour and of course Jennifer for her for her time and information and all things pets that we can do uh, to protect our pets uh, from vector borne diseases and ourselves as well. And I also just want to remind everybody that the LA County Fair is this weekend and next weekend, which we will be at uh, starting today. So we look forward to seeing all our all our LA County residents there. Uh, and of course, today is Thursday and a great reminder from our district. Every Thursday is Tip Toss Thursday. So making sure we're inspecting our yards for any stagnant water, tossing out any sources that we may no longer need or storing them in a dry area where they don't collect water. And if we do that on a weekly basis, making that a part of our habit every week, it can really make a significant difference in all our communities. All right, thank you so much, Jennifer. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. First of all, this was a lot of fun um, to go over all of this information and you guys do a really good job presenting it. Um, you know, in, in terms of um, follow up, I mean, just to let people know that we have a Los Angeles County Veterinary Public Health Program. Um, during the week, during business hours, we have a veterinarian on call um, and we, we talk to residents of LA County all the time. Um, about things like bats and mosquito disease and other animal diseases. So we're happy to answer questions. Um, I will make sure to put our contact information in the blog post. I think that's the easiest way, but you know, if you Google LA County Veterinary Public Health, it's pretty easy to find us too. And we have a lot of information on our website, so. Awesome, thank you so much. And that does round out this episode of the Bite Back Tour, Happy Homes and Healthy Pets. I'll leave you all with one last joke here. What do you get if you cross a gold dog with a telephone? a golden receiver. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and stay